All right, what's going on, Retake Loungers? Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Retake Lounge. Today, we are going to be talking about betting. We might not hit every single betting in the book that we have, but we're going to talk about the bettings that we have experience with and other mainstream bettings that are out there. Uh, don't forget, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Go ahead and like and comment. Interact with us in those comments. If you guys are feeling down, we have an amazing Patreon uh, that is going to be Patreon slash The Retic Lounge. Join us there. We have an awesome Discord. We are almost at 30 members, and we have a great positive community that is all about keeping retics and building the community in a positive way. As well, just remember, become a member of US Arc. Member numbers are the most important thing ever, so make sure you're backing up the people that are backing us up in the reptile industry. Yeah, so, man, I... I, I I mean, where do we even start with betting? I feel like there's there's so much to talk about, and a lot of it is so controversial. So any thoughts? We're winging this, by the way, guys. Betting. So I want to start right off the bat just what we use every single day. Um, we might be biased, but it works for us, and with retics, it works extremely well. So let's start off with paper. Why do paper. we choose paper as a substrate? Yeah, paper's awesome. And and paper comes in all shapes, form, sizes, thickness. Um, and I'm not saying that just to be funny, but literally, like you can go into a not rabbit hole. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, so let let's talk about the the benefits and why I like paper. Um and it took me a while to like paper because like I, I bought paper, I used paper, and I was like, nah, going back to my bedding. And then after three, four months of my other betting, I'm like, screw this. Takes too long to clean cages, going back to paper. And it took me about a year and a half of back and forth constantly until I've been on paper now uh, consistently, consecutively for about a year. Um, so I, I love paper because it is as simple and clean and... Um, one thing that I love what, what Nathan has said on previous episodes, it's like it's like surgical precision with your enclosures. You can lay down a flat couple pieces of paper. It looks aesthetically pleasing, maybe not as much as like a jungle type of cage, but yeah, you can you can disinfect, you can clean, and ultimately with me and Nathan breeding, the number one important thing for us is the health of our animals, and that allows us to really just make sure cages are sanitized and and yeah and neat and in six years of me using paper i haven't had one single health issue with my animals as long as i just stay on top of my husbandry clean yeah. cages like you should be doing and you know everything's been happy and healthy yeah and i i the the thing that's great about paper is when you start to grow your collection um and i grew mine pretty rapidly mm -hmm. uh when you have other types of bedding in there, um, what's cool about bedding in a way is that you can spot clean um, and you don't have to do this big overhaul where you have to, you know, you can spot clean the urates and the pee. But um, but when it came to the big overhaul cleanings of bedding with, you know, 15, 20 snakes, it just took a very long time. Um, yeah. With paper, take the snake out, put it in the holding bin, rip the paper out out spray the cage down wipe it down put paper back in it's literally just like it's such a quick step easy process whereas with other bedding you need a shop back or like a shovel or not not to say that i i haven't needed a shop back with using paper <laughs> no. i still i still get retex flooding cages from time to time so you that's know, true there, yeah it, there's still cons in in some regards i mean yeah when a retic floods a cage, it's not able to absorb it right away. So you need to be really nope. careful with water levels on on your tubs that you have in, in your enclosures, making sure that the displacement's not going to flood your cage. And especially if you're going out of town, <laughs> making sure your retic has a dry place to go is super important. So, uh, yeah, you have to be really on top of things with paper, too. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, that's definitely one of the cons about paper. Um, you know, when you go out of town, 
and you do things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you don't have the ability to clean your snake's enclosure right away. Um, you know, your snake can be sitting. And so that's why I always stress the importance of making sure that if you're getting a retic, whether it's a super door for even a mainland, um, you know, get custom, get shelves in there, get some type of elevation, let it get away from the floor if it needs to. Um, you know, but I have some snakes where I, I generally think that they get their, their, you know, they'll, they spill water on there and, and it just from observation, it's a weird thing that I I can probably explain, but it would take way too long. But I have a, a male Kalatoa that I genuinely think he spills his water to wet the paper and get damp to, to cool off sometimes. I Um, said that in our husbandry episode, even like with humidity, I, I don't do a ton of spraying or anything. And I notice like they're regulating by doing things like that, going into their water, or like wetting down their enclosure a little bit and yeah. they'll kind of provide what they need. Yeah. Um, so with bedding I, there there's, or with paper um, there's, there's this little term that I call poop stew. Um, and this is another con of paper. So this goes back to, <laughs> When when they when they crap and they pee and they spill their water bowl because they're moving around, there's times with paper where you'll go in and literally the paper if you try to pick it up it rips right in your hand, um, and there's just liquid poop and pee everywhere. And so that doesn't happen all the time, but when it does happen, it's a nightmare. Um, it's you have not gloves, Sandy. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> not it's not fun to clean. Um, and again, just with paper, like, like Nathan mentioned, you just, you need to stay on top of it. You don't want your snakes sitting on their piss and their crap, uh, soaking in that and their scales. That's how you get scale rot. Um, and you know, a lot of people say, uh, you know, well, when they pee, it just dries up, you know, that happens a lot for the younger retics, but at the end of the day, like it takes a while for that thing to dry up. And I don't know, I don't want to sit, if I piss my bed. I'm not going to just like let it dry up and then go back to sleep in it. <laughs> I'm going to wash my sheets. So uh, with paper, you find yourself cleaning more, um, more often, more regularly. But I like that because it allows me to interact with my snakes a lot more. Jeez, Nathan, you're on mute again. Sorry, I'm playing around with this new studio, trying to see our fancy overlay and all that. Uh, anyways, but yeah, it, it does allow you to be quite a bit more hands-on with your animal. You're, if you're staying on top of your husbandry, you're cleaning a couple times a week with paper. So you're definitely taking them out, socializing them a little bit while you're doing all of that. So yeah. beyond paper, I mean, I think the next big substrate that everyone's kind of dabbled around with would be some sort of cocoa. So whether that be cocoa chunks, fiber, you know, insert brand name here. Yeah. Um, I like, I don't know if you've seen Brian Cusco's music video of, of advertising for cocoa blocks from freedom beers. But every time I think of cocoa, I have like his little faint singing in the background. Um, but, um, yeah. So, um, have you used like Rutty Chick or Cocoa Block or any type of Cocoa Husk sub- substrate? Uh, some, I, I, you, when I had ball pythons way before the retics, I used some sort of really fine cocoa and it was, it was fine. It, it worked pretty well. I, uh, I did notice, I think a time or two where I didn't, I. Uh, spot clean well enough that I had little bits of mold develop. So I think that was one of the issues I ended up running into it. Um, I mean, same thing. You should just stay on top of your husbandry. As long as you're spot cleaning well enough, you should avoid things like that. But yeah. yeah. And, and, and I agree. I, so I, I would say that after paper, the bedding that I've used the most has been, I specifically use RepTiChip because RepTiChip is located here in San Antonio where I live. So I don't have to pay shipping and can just go buy a bunch of blocks, super discounted because I can yeah. buy them in bulk. Um, but um, I, I love RepTiChip um, and I, I love, I mean, any type of cocoa. I, I like the substrate a lot and I did struggle initially with some of the mold things that you are mentioning. Um, what I noticed about the molding is I didn't have enough air circulation in my room. Mm-hmm. I increased that circulation that got rid of that problem. But, um, 
Well, and that so, very well could have been it. I was that was my first rack system as I was first getting into the hobby, and I don't I don't know if there was enough ventilation in those tubs. I yeah, mean. yeah, it, it, that could be a reason. But on on top of that, um, because they they the the cocoa chips do resist mold a little bit better than most of the other beddings. But um, yeah, I I loved it because number one, um it doesn't have like a, a really crazy odor or anything and it absorbs the pee and the poop odor so, so well. Um, amazingly. Like, and that was one of the biggest complaints before on why I'd always go back to it when I was keeping on papers. Cause at the time I was keeping my snakes inside the house and, and my wife would look at me and she's like, I'm going to stab you because my house smells like retic pee and, and poop when I was keeping on paper. And when I switched to Repti chip, it was night and day difference. Um, I like it as well because it provides a little texture. It's aesthetically appealing. It looks pretty. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a, I'm a fan of it, but again, it goes back for me in terms of, of simplicity and the reason why I, I, I go back to paper, but, um, but I think it's, some... it's a great option for things like humid yeah. hides. I mean, yeah. it, as far as enrichment in your enclosure, I think that's that's great. Add in a tub with a little hole and some wet down repti chip or something a little chunkier. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, I also use, um, uh, you know, cocoa chips um, for my uh, lay boxes. So right now my Philippine female is sitting okay. in a lay box and all there is is repti. Yeah, repti chip in there. I did that for my Kadiwadi. Um and so it's what's great is that it holds moisture really well and so it's it, it can increase humidity very well which when you have a gravid female and she's going to be laying a clutch you want her to have great humidity and to be sitting on a place where she's comfortable and typically they lay in the rainy seasons in Indonesia so they they are laying on a wet moist floor so um I, I use it for a bunch of different reasons. I've used it for humid hides. I've used it for lay boxes. I've used it as full bedding. And as a matter of fact, completely forgot about this. I still use Repti Chip today. Um, on my jungle cages, I have these awesome mm -hmm. big shelves that have a two inch lip. And on all of the shelves, I put Repti Chip on top of there. Number one, to add texture, something different other than paper. Cleaning those shelves when they get pee and poop on them, when I was keeping the uh, paper on them, it, it was just annoying and so just having a shelf that i could put repti chip on there um was was i love it it helps maintain humidity it's it's really cool provides a shedding aid for the animal that i mean enrichment just in textural differences so i mean they're the benefits of doing that for your animals is probably huge yeah now let me talk about some cons of repti chip because I had a really bad experience, uh, or, or uh, of of not repti chip, but just cocoa chips, um, a coconut substrate. Um, so I don't think they make good substrate for babies and for hatchlings. Um, I had a my holdback female actually got impacted with um, repti, uh, a little piece, and I was using like a smaller version of like the normal size like chunks that they're like this big i was using a smaller version and it w managed to uh my snake managed to get impacted and fortunately with like a straight week of soaking for an hour every single day not feeding it um she she ended up regurgitating it like it, it was that impacted that it didn't even go down into like the di digestive tract um and so fortunately she she regurgitated it and she's fine now but um it, it there is a possibility of impact for smaller animals. Um, I don't think for large retics you got to worry about like a health concern with with repti chip and impaction because they're really only, you know, that that big. I don't know if you can even see that on camera, but um, <laughs> damn it, um, <laughs> shapes by Lucas. <laughs> Uh, one episode <laughs> I won't make a shape. Um I'm I'm Italian. I talk with my hands, okay? Hey, you um, didn't draw it this time. <laughs> so um so anyways, uh yeah, so with bigger retakes, I don't think it's that big of a concern. Um, but with like your your babies in up to a year, I, I would try to stay away from 
that because uh, it's not often that it happens, but when it does happen, it's definitely life threatening for your animal. And I, I think that's kind of a major con with anything other than paper in a lot of regards. So impaction is just a big thing that's on our mind. We don't want our snakes swallowing something they shouldn't. But I mean, out in the wild, they're probably taking in stuff they shouldn't all the time too. So yeah, how impactful is it? Um, I get it. A, impactful. Yeah, impactful. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, <laughs> we, we just don't want to add in any uh, variables that can end up in impaction at least in in my ways of keeping yeah i mean you like you've mentioned you're literally like a surgeon everything for you is like sterile perfect clean precise like you you have a very and i actually admire you have a very ocd like like i think way. it is i think it is ocd i, I see <laughs> a lot of tendencies in my um but but it's 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 pretty impressive uh the way that everything is just so precision like when i put my paper down i lay it down there's like folding creases and it's all bundled and it looks like crap and then i look at your cages and it's like just like just like nice perfect Lu lucas watched me uh do some cleaning as i was introducing this year and he's like wait wait how are you putting that paper in just like, right just like suck it, it in like holding it i don't know <laughs> literally my 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 helper sean who's 14 years old a freshman in high school shout out to sean he's a patreon member join patreon um he literally is better than putting paper in my freaking enclosures than i am <laughs> i just don't have the patience man i'm just like get in there um, oh, i can teach you i'll come i'll come down to texas yeah you will <laughs> so anyways back to cocoa chips because that's what we're talking about right now um overall i like them like if i was to go with a bedding outside of paper it's going to be uh some type of of cocoa block chip repti I i'm trying to do it without like specifically mentioning but it's really hard um no i so i think the same i when i go in to finally add my humid hides once i stop procrastinating um it's either going to be some form of repti chip or I mean, if I really want to do it a little safer, maybe moss. S s how do you say it? Sphagum Sphag moss? Sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss. Okay. It's, it's, I actually, I love using that. Um, and, and while we're just talking about humid hides and things like that, um, I, you know, you can get on Amazon 15 bucks of organic sphagnum moss. Um, <laughs> I'm butchering that so bad. But anyways, you can get for like 15 bucks and that little block will last you a while. If you're just making humid hides, it's always good to just have on hand. I, I recommend that. But um, also like as part of bedding, um, if you're using a naturalistic setup with like a, a cocoa chip or any type of other wood or stuff like that, like just to be able to shove different textures, like put moss in there, spray it down, have some dry moss. Some of my smaller snakes, um, I, I, with my hatchling rack that I had before I was selling them and, and moving them out, um, I would actually put a little moss inside some of the tubs and just spray it down and they'd love hiding under it. And it mm -hmm. kind of just makes them feel secure, like kind of like they're in the wild. Yeah, you can, you can apply that going back to the pushing episode. If you want to throw in a bunch of moss into a little hatchling tub that provides a ton of security, a little bit of humidity there, they would love it. So, okay, we I think we talked enough about that. Um, let's let's get into. Um, so we talked about paper, talked about cocoa chip and fibers. Oh, by the way, the whole cocoa spectrum. It, it you have like big chips like repti chick and cocoa blocks, and then you get all the way down to a very fine, like, Parmesan cheese grated textured, um, cocoa. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, cocoa fiber, cocoa. No, no, the fibers are the strands. So you can also get cocoa fiber where it's like mm -hmm. strands. Um, but then you can get like a compressed, um, like very fine chips. That's like fine graded um, where it's good for like bioactive enclosures and things like that, that um, holds humidity really, really well. Um, I know a lot of people use that to increase humidity or if they're doing like a, a you know, a soil type of base, uh, they mix that in there, but since we're on the topic of 
like soil base. Um, I don't have much experience with it, Nathan, but like, what, what do you know about, like, I know there's people who mix like part soil with sand and this like cocoa fiber stuff. Uh, I'm going to know about as much as you, I haven't played around with it at all yet. Um, I think if I eventually get into tree monitors, something a little smaller, that's not going to destroy everything in the enclosure. Maybe I would go try out a bioactive setup, but, uh, with retics, I just, I don't see the need to put in all that time, especially when I'm looking at everything in the breeding aspect, uh, for something that very well is just going to get trampled over by these animals. Yeah. I, uh, I looked at a retic keeper. Uh, he is a mainland keeper. So, I mean, he has a lot more snake to uh, trample over plants and such, but he, he's tried it out with a few of his snakes in only one cage still has any plants left or, you know, any of that bioactivity going on. I'm sure there's other retic keepers that are doing it and maybe it just requires a little bit larger setup and, you know, I, I'm sure it, I'm sure it would be really cool to see a retic in a fully bioactive, beautifully planted enclosure. But I just think for, for my sake, that's, that's not the route I'm going for right yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, I admire them. Um, and, I and do. I know, I think there's, um, I, I want to say, uh, his name is Scott Severs. He's been switching over to bioactive, even with some okay. of his larger enclosures. So I know the name, but I didn't know that. Yeah. So Scott, uh, well, so bioactive. So what bioactive means is, is having living organisms inside of your enclosure, like you would in the wild to break down the urine and the poop and, and having a naturalistic like soil base. And, and, um, as I'm pausing, trying to think of other things to include, this is a great time to remind you guys, we are not experts. Um, Mm -mm. and and we don't ever pretend to be, I don't know anything. Yeah, I don't know anything about bioactive. So for those of you listening, tuning in, watching on YouTube, comment below. If you keep bioactive, correct us, please. Um, Tell us what you put in your bioactive enclosures. Uh, Teach me and Nathan something. That's exactly what our our community is about. We like to learn from you guys. So anyways, bioactive. So people put leaves in there. People put uh, a soil mix. um, And and you need to get like springtails and isopods and different insects i guess they are i don't know again ignorance cleanup crew yeah cleanup crew um but i think it's amazing i actually have a goal of wanting to go bioactive for smaller enclosures for holdbacks until i put them in bigger enclosures that's like a goal of mine because when you have a bioactive enclosure that is thriving upkeep is like very minimal and that that's like that's a dream for me. Um, so the, and then also just being able to observe them going through leaves and soil and, and different, you know, it, I think it would be aesthetically appealing to see. And you can include plants in there because again, everything is natural. Um, if you do plants, you probably need some type of lighting for them to 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 grow in there. Um, I know there's some like pothos or things that do well with minimal lighting, but um, yeah, I think well, bioact. There's, there's workarounds now too. You can make something look bioactive that your retic can't destroy yeah yeah so um for those of you doing bioactive with retics it, it's somewhat a new thing that people are doing let us know how that's going because i really do want to know like is it is it advantageous for for larger retics um I, i'm assuming you still have to like spot clean big poops um I don't think oh, yeah. a cleanup crew is going to just <laughs> go over that. But as far as like the urine and things like that, um, probably needs more upkeep than like a bioactive for frogs or for geckos. But um, yeah, I mean, the idea behind bioactive in my mind with the smaller retics is like less work, the better if you can get it established. So um, I like the idea of it. I just have never done it. Yeah, same here. Now, moving on from bioactive, since we don't have a ton to add to that that topic, uh, do you want to maybe go over some of the other like wood based substrates that you see in the hobby? Like, I don't know, Aspen comes to mind. Yeah, um, actually, one person right now is just watching a video during breeding season to increase humidity to wet it down. I think uh, uh, Weston at Wildfire is using Aspen right now. Um, 
And so, yeah, I mean, Aspen, I used back in the day. I used Aspen when I was a kid and I used it solely for that. Um, yeah, I used I, it with I, my ball pythons a little bit. I like it because it's light and fluffy. Um, if you have like any racks or anything, super easy to just dump out and clean uh, they without can burrow too, under. too. Yeah, they can burrow under. It's a very fluffy, light substrate. So they, it provides depth on your floor level. They can go under it, they can go over it. Um, and it's not, not, it's not, Cocoa blocks, you can't really do that. It's a very dense, heavier, you know, if you put a very large layer of it, they probably could, but I like Aspen for being light. Um, I didn't find it very dusty. I think it's less dusty than than like the cocoa uh, chip type of stuff. Uh, the cocoa chip, I didn't even mention that, but yeah, it can be very dusty. Um, okay. So um, I'm a fan of it. The one downside I remember as a kid using it is I, I would see... Like if water spilled, only took a couple days for me to see mold on it. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if I ever ran into molding issues with Aspen. I can't remember, but yeah, I'm sure just the same as cocoa. If you don't have the proper ventilation and all that, you can end up getting some molding. Yeah. And I would say as far as like comparing Aspen bedding to the other wood bedding we've talked about, which are cocoa chips, probably less of a hazard for impaction and actually oh, yeah. like hurting and, and hurting your animal. Yeah. Aspen, I think as far as it accidentally being swallowed is probably pretty safe, uh, especially compared to stuff like it's a little bit chunkier, like cypress mulch. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really don't have too much more to add on Aspen. It's been a very long time since I used it. Um, I, I know. Okay. So wait, there's a, there's a bedding in the UK that it's more mainstream in the UK that looks like Aspen bedding, but it starts with an L. Lie. No clue. Yeah. I'm not sure on that one. Let me, let me see if I can pull it up but if i, I probably so won't. while you're then, pulling it up i uh, have you used cypress mulch for anything in the past i know you don't yeah. know okay yeah. what, what have you used uh, it for what were your thoughts on cypress mulch i did it early on with keeping retics um okay. and i actually did like it a lot um i like cypress mulch a lot kept humidity up during the winter um it was um easy to to apply um I, I like the texture that it provides it looks nice um the issue with cypress mulch is one you have to make sure depending on where you live in the country um you have to make sure that you have access to uh pure cypress mulch if you can because there are mulch blends that have softwood mulch in there things like pine that are toxic to uh reptiles and, and specifically snakes um so you have to be careful what kind of mulch you get. Just don't go buy random mulch, but cypress mulch. Yeah, and, don't and, don't and, go down to Home Depot and get your yeah. substrate, please. Now, I will say that some people do go to Lowe's or Home Depot and they get the no... Uh, or the, yeah, the, if you're very careful, you know what you're getting. You, there's a, there's a specific it, right? bag of like no float cypress mulch or something like that. It's like the black label one. Um, but that is a uh, that's a good mulch to use. I couldn't find that in my area. It was never to be found. So what I would do is I would go to a garden nursery, like a plant nursery, and I would just get organic, one hundred percent cypress mulch. Yeah. And and to be honest, for like a forty pound bag, um, was only like six bucks, seven bucks, and so it's pretty affordable. It lasts a while. Affordability is great. Um, Oh, that's one thing that we haven't even talked about, the other bedding. So paper, super affordable. Cocoa blocks, if you're not buying in bulk and you have to order online, not affordable. It's pretty expensive. Yep. 30 bucks a block if you buy them individually. You can get them for about 13 bucks a block if you buy 15 of them. But if you have to get them shipped to you, they have to ship it on a pallet. Now you're looking at it like $100 of shipping. So keep that in mind. Um, and then Aspen, don't even know what that goes for. Um, paper, really, I want to say I'm spending about 30 to $50 a roll. It just depends on what size. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't talk about differences in the types of paper rolls we get. I have corrugated paper rolls. I have just regular flat 
paper rolls that have no texture to them. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know that, that makes a huge difference. I feel like the corrugated stuff is maybe a little bit more absorbent than just the flat paper, but it's, it's thicker. Um, I, I prefer the corrugated a little bit more than the flat craft paper, but because the craft paper comes in just the non corrugated version on Uline comes in a 30 inch depth and my enclosures are 30 inches. I, I switched over to that and I'm happy with it, but, um, welcome to the squirrel show where we're going to be jumping all over the place. Um, so, yeah, timestamps won't know what to do with us, right? <laughs> what are timestamps? Um, so yeah, we were talking about mulch. There we go, mulch. Um, yeah, super affordable. Um, and I like them. My biggest concern with mulch is impaction because now we're talking about really big pieces mm -hmm. and not just big pieces, but sharp pieces. Yeah, that's that's my biggest concern just looking at it. I've never used it so. Yeah, impaction comes to mind as soon as I see that stuff. Um, now, what about, uh, I know you've mentioned quite a bit in the past, uh, and I've seen people use it at shows and in their enclosures online, but hardwood fuel pellets. Yeah. I so What's the deal, Lucas? <laughs> they're, man, hardwood fuel pellets are amazing. Um, I actually... I, I take back what I said about cocoa chips. Um, that's not my my favorite uh, of the wood. So hardwood fuel pellets, they take literally hardwood. So um, and they compress it into these little pellets. And what they're typically used for are like burners and smokers and fires. Um, but I'm, I, I, my tractor supply here in Texas had like hardwood fuel pellets in stock only one time the entire six years that I was here and I bought a shit ton of it and I used it and I loved it. Um, it was my absolute favorite bedding. I actually prefer it over paper. If I could find it right now, I would use it over paper. It's extremely absorbent. When it gets wet, the wood breaks down. And when you spot clean it, you can literally spot clean it. And then you can take a wipe with like brown Listerine and disinfect just that area while the dry wood pellets are on the other side of the enclosure. Um, it is amazing. Just as good as Repti Chip as uh, getting rid of the uh, smell of pee and poop. Um, and 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 it lasts a long time like they can pee on it and the wood chips will blow up and swell and they'll swell until eventually they break down but um man the stuff lasts forever um you Affordability. can uh, dude it's so affordable for for 40 pounds was like 4.99 when i was buying it and 40 pounds will will fill up a uh like 41 quart tub you you could like if you had a, a rack of five 41 quart tubs and you had a bag of 40, you could probably go through that rack two different times. Um, it, it's and, and again, you're spot cleaning. So literally it could last forever. Um, yeah. I, and not a lot of people know about it and not a lot of people um, have used it. A lot of people that have tried it, haven't liked it or they, they love it. It's either you love it or you hate it type of thing. It's the same thing with paper. I feel like paper, you either love it or you yeah. hate it. Um, same thing with the hardwood fuel pellets. But um, yeah, I'm jealous. I, I can't find it anywhere here. They're over on the East Coast everywhere. Um, Aubrey Pruitt uses it year round. And um, I, I, if I had any in stock here where I live at any time during the year, I would get it. Um, the one negative side to it is that uh, it does have the tendency to mold at times. Um, so it can mold if you're not sp spot cleaning the, the wet parts of it. Um, but I feel like that goes for really any bedding. I mean, have you ever, I mean, I've seen mold sometimes when I lift a water bowl from paper, I yeah. see a little bit of mold on the paper. Yeah. So I feel like that happens as, as long as there's moisture and humidity in an enclosure, mold is only going to happen if your air circulation just isn't sufficient for the amount of humidity that's in the enclosure. Yeah. Circulation is super important in your enclosures, having some kind of ventilation will help prevent that quite a bit. And even though it'll help prevent it, if you're not on top of your stuff, it'll still cultivate. Yeah. 
Um, so one thing I want to mention about hardwood fuel pellets, you're going to, you're going to go to tractor supplier. You're going to look for them after hearing this podcast and you're going to be like, let me find them. There are hardwood fuel pellet blends that have softwood in it. Anything that has softwood. I mean, those, so softwood, an example of softwood is pine. It's toxic to your snakes. Um, there are people that argue that the way that they compress and turn the wood into these pellets, they're removing and extracting the oil from the wood. I I don't buy it. I wouldn't risk it. I wouldn't put my snakes on any type of softwood. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. So going into maybe like hatchling substrates. So for me, I'll keep on wet paper towels to kind of start off my hatchlings. Make sure they have enough moisture that they're ready for their first shed. Uh, how much? How like how much water do you put in there? Because I know a lot like, of people vary. Uh, for me, I soak the paper towel pretty pretty damp, and then just set it in. I don't like leave excess water on top of the paper towel, I, but. I, I know people that are doing just straight water with their fresh hatchlings. Yeah. Um, do you use the quicker picker upper? Bounty. Yep. Um, so I I I do I did the same thing for my last clutch. Like I so I will put them on paper towel and I, I just I spray it down until basically I can see a little bit of water build up. Mm-hmm. Um you, so the reason why you do that with hatchlings, number one, they require a little bit higher humidity, especially when they haven't had that first shed. So you want to get them into that first shed. Um, a lot of people keep them, like Nathan said, on a little layer of water. Um, or what I've seen a lot of people do, which I think is really cool, is after they hatch, they'll go ahead and remove them. And then what they'll do is they'll put all the hatchlings back into a separate tub with like water or wet paper towel, but they'll put the hatchlings back into the incubator until they have their prelay shed and then they'll take them out one by one. Um, so I don't know. It sounds like the general consensus, at least what I use, you use, and what I've heard people use the most is typically some type of paper towel to spray down and, and wet. Yep. That was, that was the best for me. And when, when those paper towels start to dry up, if that retic hasn't already peed or soiled that paper towel somehow, um, I'll go in the same way, just spray it back down. Um, and that that has helped all of my hatchlings have decent first sheds. So I'm going to stick yeah. with it. <laughs> now, now I, I know that there's a con of paper towels and, and there's a picture that surfaced on, on uh, social media and there, there is a risk of paper towels. So yeah. if, you're, if your snake strikes a food item and happens to catch one of its teeth on a paper towel, it's going to end up more than likely consuming that paper towel with its meal and if it's a big piece of paper towel you're in trouble that snake might not be able to pass it um might need a vet visit in order to get it out um so paper towel is something that i do not absolutely i do not recommend for anything outside of like a hatchling that's at you know less than six months um yeah once- I, I only did the paper towel for maybe uh couple weeks or no not even a couple weeks probably a week and then as soon as they had you know shed out and eaten their first meal or two i was trying to do just paper yeah yeah and that that's that's not so i came up and i and i finally found this uh cmc website uh that's that's the paper i was using yeah so i i didn't i did not know that website when I had my hatchlings last year. So now I have for my six quart shoe, but uh, shoe box tubs, I have CMC pre-cut for the six quarts. Um, so I'm going to use that, but, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd be transitioning them to that probably after like a month, once they've had a couple sheds, few meals, put them back on normal paper, spray down the paper a little bit before I put them in. Um, but as far as like fresh out of the egg, absolutely paper towel spray down soaking wet like i'm talking about like get that paper towel soaking wet don't don't be afraid yeah exactly um and even if there's a just a tiny little dribble of water that's standing in there that's okay 
um, they, they really need that for their first shot or two. Yeah. Anything else that you want to hit on, on this episode? Um, commercial betting. So the, the zoo meds and the betting that you get at pet smart, those kind of things. So, um, just be careful. Which with will that. fall into kind of some of the, the categories of, uh, betting that we've already gone over, but with a different yeah. price point. Yeah. And that's, that's the big thing that I just wanted to hit on. Like if you guys are buying cocoa chips from PetSmart or from Petco or, uh, or you're, you're buying, uh, Aspen, you know, the zoo med Aspen betting, you're going to be spending triple quadruple the amount that if you were to go with a more natural, um, non mainstream blend. I mean, the, the purpose of those kind of products is literally to sell a, a catch all, you go to a store, you get a glass aquarium, you get the reptile bedding, you get the reptile hide, and you get the cool rock, dimpled, water bowl. All that stuff is over-marketed, overpriced. Um, if you don't know where to find affordable bedding, reach out to us. Um, it, it's it's really bedding. I feel like bedding in today's day and age should not be expensive unless you have a bunch of animals. You should be able to easily find an affordable bedding option for you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if I had just one or two animals, I'd probably be doing it a different way, you know, probably bioactive, trying to really right. deck the thing out. But, you know, just depends on what's appropriate for you. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I want to talk about, we're going to pop up a little image somewhere here. Um, we're, I, I want to show an image that, that Daniel Solis uh, with Jungle Diaries uh, was willing to send us to use for this episode. He sent us an awesome picture of a. It was that the Karampa in that picture. Karampa, yeah. Karampa. Okay. He, he said it was on the Karampa Island that this photo was taken on, uh, and I was just talking with him uh, a little bit before this episode, saying, "Hey, you know, I, I really appreciate all the work you've done, just traveling, just to see these animals and really learn a little bit more about them." would you mind sharing a picture of one you found laying on the ground somewhere? What is it? Yeah. laying on? So, I mean, it's, it's, we'll have the image up here for you guys to look, but obviously a very cute, small looking wild retic, super silver eyes, by the way, really cool. But it it's laying on a bed of like different broken up fibrous wood means with big leaves um, as much so, as we've dogged it, what what would you say that that substrate looks like? Um, this episode, we've already talked about it. I'd say it looks like cypress mulch. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, if you like zoom in and you look at the different fibers, you could definitely tell there's different type different of woods. Fibers, but yeah. different yeah. woods. There's twigs, leaves. Everything yeah. ground up into this. Substance yeah, it's and, and that's really cool because I think it provides so for for a lot of you new keepers of retakes, you guys are really pushing the industry forward with with finding different ways to make naturalistic and beautiful enclosures. Um, so I'm hoping that you see this image and those of you that are bioactive uh, geeks and spend 75 bucks on isopods and 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 you know on bugs, um, you know not not that that's not okay, um, but um, I'd love to see someone try to recreate what this image is showing. There's a bunch of natural leaves, uh, very compressed, tightly packed, different type of wood fibers, twigs that are tiny all the way to large. Um, yeah, I, I think that that um, I, I, I want to challenge some of you that are doing bioactives to try to recreate this and see what you guys get. Well, and reach out to people who have been over to the area. I mean... Try to get as much information as you can, pictures as you can, about what kind of environment these animals are living in, and try to replicate it. It'd be really cool to see. Yeah. Um, so again, Daniel, thanks for the picture. Thanks for letting us use it. Um, just an awesome example of literally a retic just out in the open, being covered with trees above it, and having a bunch of broken pieces of trees and wood all below it. Um, I think that that gives us a good idea of what a lot of these snakes are laying on if they're not in cave systems and things like that. Yeah. And I, I say go on to Daniel's page too, because you'll see pictures of him with his group and 
in the cave systems with these snakes. So it's not just out on this kind of substrate that you'll find them. There's other just kind of more dirt substrates that you'll see them on too dirt rock so you got to really get creative if you want to provide all the different substrates and surfaces that these animals are used to in the wild yeah um i I don't think that any of the the beddings that we mentioned today are necessarily bad i think they all have each their pros or cons and and i think we talked a good amount on the pros and cons of each of them pricing point things like that um so Nathan, do you have anything else to add? Uh, No, I just want to remind everyone, jump over to the Patreon, become a lounger today. We have a bunch of stuff that we're trying to add on, uh, different videos, content of Lucas and I working with our uh, animals throughout the week. So uh, jump over there, make sure you're a member of US ARC, um, and we'll see you on the next one, as always. Have a good one. See you guys.